So in your lecture yesterday, you were connecting uh, ancient liturgy, and even, even as you suggested in an earlier question today, connecting the ancient liturgy, even reformed liturgy, uh, with possibilities for future practice. Um, in that talk, you also made the reference that John Calvin cared about youth ministry. So let's put the two together. Let's talk a little bit. Which was, you know, that was a revelation to me, by the yeah, way. Yeah. I and mean, you said yeah. they really had a lot to do with caring for children and the liturgy for children. And he was, he was deeply invested his whole life in crafting a catechism for children. Um, yeah. So let's talk about it. What is, what, is, what is the relationship between liturgy and youth ministry? I mean, I think um, you could put it together this way. If you see that liturgy is about formation, right? So liturgy is a conduit and means of grace by which God is making us and molding us and shaping us. And you realize that our orientations to the world are things that we absorb. There is nothing more important than children's ministry. Do you know what I mean? Like, like in a way, by the time an 18 year old is sitting in my college class, the formative ship has sailed in a lot of ways, right? I mean, we could, that's not to say that the spirit can do anything, right? And obviously, and some of us are, you know, late converts, Christianity and God can, but you're, you're, you're always going to be undoing habitual orientations to the world that you've absorbed. And if we can attend to that from the beginning, um, we are investing right away in sort of implanting and infusing a kingdom orientation into the very habit structures of children. By the way, we don't talk to children about this, but it's, it's, a, it's a different way of being attuned to Christian formation, which is not just teaching them the information of the stories, but looking for rhythms and, and, and rituals that invite them to inhabit the story. Mm -hmm. Part of that, I think, is um and, and it's not essentially or exclusively liturgical, but that sense that children are a part of the body yes. of Christ now. You know, this thing about children as a church of the tomorrow, I, I actually, I kind of go, ah, because it's, it, they're here now. They're part of our, the family of God now. Now we have different ways of how we look at that and whether we're gonna baptize them or you know, somehow give them to the Lord, and what, that, that's fine. But I think that, you know, since liturgy doesn't have to be about language, some of it is, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be at all levels about language. Mm -hmm. is it doesn't matter even what your, uh, what your facility, to, facility is with language. You're already entering in, especially if you're invited in and made a part of the whole. You described a beautiful um, pattern at your own congregation about how you involve children in this. Can you just say more you about You know, that? we're always looking for new ways, I think, because I think we've just begun to sort of explore this, but uh, especially around the, we do have a time for teaching of children, or teaching with children, we call it that rather than, because we're always learning from them too. Uh, when we have the readings of scripture and the sermon, then the children are kind of in an age appropriate place separate from the congregation. But when we bring the offering to God, the offering not just of money, but of ourselves and the gifts of bread and wine, then they return to, to be a part of the congregation for, for communion. So, and it's a little crazy. I mean, there are sometimes I pause in the prayers of the communion and it sounds like I'm at a dog pound. I mean, it's just, <laughs> there are all these noises and kids, and, but, but, but when the children start to respond, alleluia, or when they begin to sing the songs that we use during communion and they have no, um, you know, they're not holding back. It, it's, it's the little child will lead them. I mean, there's just that beautiful picture of um, they just get it. They take it. They run with it. Um, they teach the rest of us. Um, and they're not told, shh, be quiet. And then, and then they come forward for communion. And it's up to parents whether they receive or and there's a whole lot of conversations around that. But that, that's one way we model that is to say, oh, it's not, oh, you're in some other place in the building for the whole service. You're part of our body here. You're part of our family here. It's beautiful. It fits a lot with, so Calvin's particular concern in this children's catechism, the place he ended up was, he thought the heart of catechesis of children was to help them understand why we do what we do when we worship. And so the catechism in a way was structured by the rhythms of a worship service. 
and um, and I think that's exactly right. And there there are interesting uh, resources now. So in Christian Reformed Church, of which I'm a part, we have our children in worship curriculum for young children, is is a very tangible. It's almost like sort of Montessori Sunday school. So it's very tangible, communal, tactile, but the but it also is teaching them what is the Lord's Supper, what is baptism, and they get to touch water and they get to hold elements. And there's something. Uh, um, the way to the heart is through the body, right? And I think that physicality is itself an expression of sacramentality. There's another curriculum often used in Episcopal churches uh, and Roman Catholic church. You'll, you'll know the play. godly play. Yes, exactly. Uh, um, I think there are really interesting resources out there. But then the unfortunate thing is, I, it seems to me we are getting better at being much more intentional for young children. But then from sort of like, eight to 17, we fall back into very bad habits of either an entertainment paradigm or a totally didactic intellectualist paradigm. And I think there needs to be a lot more work done on what does it look like to craft communities of young people who are pursuing the spiritual disciplines together, right? That's what uh, um, a liturgical formation would look like. And, and I think it would bear fruit uh, that our entertainment model has clearly not. You're, uh, some people might not know what catechism is. Could you explain what, what it means to catechize Yeah, catechism is just sort of an old, uh, um, fairly ancient, but also really important to the reformers. Uh, it's a mode of instruction of question and response. It can become very mechanical and rote as well, um, but in, in my tradition we use the Heidelberg Catechism, which is actually, I think, a very warm uh, piety about it and the idea is is it w walks you through the sort of whole council of scripture um, and uh, the the question and response has almost a sort of Socratic element to it right you you sort of put a question on a child's tongue that in a way would be a question that they would ask and then you answer it with the resources of the scriptures that encapsulates it and um, the thing about catechetical instruction is anything that's formative has to be repetitive um, and because catechetical instruction is repetitive, one of the things that happens is these, these answers start to sort of seep in to your bones. And they will come back at moments when you might least expect it. Um, and they can come back in the lives of prodigals too. Uh, because they're there, they're, they're, uh, um, they've been woven into their character. And it's a way of remembering who they are. The, the, um, opening question and answer of uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, the, the answer is, um, well, the question is, what is my only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is that I'm not my own, but I belong body and soul to my faithful savior, Jesus Christ. And almost anybody in our tradition can immediately rattle that off. And that's a pretty good reminder of who I am and whose I am. That's on the tip of a tongue. Um, I, I think it's a powerful witness. So what might you say to a youth pastor uh, who's thinking through his or her uh, own approach to youth ministry, uh, maybe feels dissatisfied with the in entertainment paradigm, on the other hand knows that's ex the expectation of the congregation, it, it's what draws students, um, but again is looking for something more, what, what would a liturgical approach or a catechism kind of approach how might something like that, how might you be able to inform uh, how they could go about their, their ministry? And maybe even it's even just thinking through how the, the children relate to the larger congregational life. Anything, what, what, what resources, what liturgical resources might you offer? There was a church I was part of uh, in Denver, a liturgical church, when our kids were that age, high school, junior high age. And um, one thing to remember was that youth, the, the ministry was still fun. I mean, I think there's a sense of which, oh, we're going to bring some liturgy in. Yeah. It's going to it's going to kill this thing. It's going to be dead. It was still a lot of fun, and there was just a lot of excitement around it. But but what they understood, what those what those young people knew, is they knew the Lord's Prayer, they knew the Creed, they knew the command, the Ten Commandments. Uh, they had times of liturgical prayer. They had times of communion together. Uh, these were things that. Um, were part of their regular gatherings. Um, and they also had a really a strong heart for the community around, for the world, for justice, and, 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 and things like that. So it, it, was, it was 
it was sort of you know age appropriate yeah. liturgical activity yeah. um, that still was a lot of fun. But it, but one of the things it did is it, it it really said you were not like the world. Yes. Yes. It told these young people you were not like the world, um, and you can't be. Yes. And this exactly. is why because you're gods. Brilliant. Yeah. I. Um, I have a, a beef with a lot of paradigms in youth ministry. And I, I think it's partly because of the fact that people who tend to w want to be youth ministers are very extroverted folks, <laughs> you know? And then it becomes easy. So the whole paradigms of youth ministry then have this kind of extroversion as assumed. And then we create youth ministries and youth experiences for extroverts and we and we don't we just underestimate how alienating and difficult that is for kids who are not wired that way to the extent that they think if I can't be that way I guess I can't be a Christian and you know th and there's all kinds of weird stuff that happens for those other kids to be in a way given practices to inhabit um, to be given a prayer book to be given the Psalms and the, the morning prayer and evening prayer as, a, as an inherited ritual is in a way uh, um, completely liberating and life-giving because now it doesn't depend on their performance. It doesn't depend on their expressive abilities. And um, I, I think youth ministries should recognize that that is a powerful gift that we could give to a lot of kids in our youth groups that otherwise are just can't imagine how to be a Christian otherwise. There are ways to be creative with that too. Um, there's, a, there's a call and response we have in, in liturgy, which is the Lord be with you and also with you. It's probably an early Christian greeting. Uh, our youth group in Denver, uh, the kids had their own, it was sort of like the Lord be with you and right back at you. I mean, they did their, <laughs> there was, but, but, but they were entering into the shape of it. Yeah. And the essence of what it was, but in a way that sort of they could be creative sure. with it, and and I and that was sure. and totally appropriate. It was yeah. great. Faithful contextualization, yeah. right yeah. there. Yeah. That's great. 